The following podcast includes scary stories with content that could be triggering to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. <clears throat> testing, testing, one, two, check, one, two, check, one, two. Test, test, test. Baby Baker bakes a baby bunt. Baby Baker bakes a baby bunt. Baby Baker bakes a baby bunt. Mm. Just a few seconds and... We're on the air. Welcome back, dear listener, to another Q&A. That's right. For those of you diehards, you'll remember that I spent many years as an AM radio host of my own legendary show, Dark Air. Sometimes I miss the grind and the sweet, sweet sound of feedback, so I thought I'd bring it back. My niece Susie is still with me, (laughs) unfortunately. I actually don't really know when she's supposed to leave, but no matter, she's here, and she's going to press all the buttons for me today. Isn't that right, Susie? (laughs) Very good, sweetheart. Very good. Wrong button, but nonetheless, something is severely wrong with that child. Okay, let's go to the first question. Listener, you're on. Uh, hi, Terry. I was wondering if you could possibly give some, like, cool wedding songs to dance to. My fiancé and I just got engaged, and we would love your opinion on that. Thank you, caller. Thank you so much. Uh, best of luck on your upcoming nuptials. I, Terry Carnation, I've been married a few times. Uh, we all know about the mysterious disappearance of my last wife, uh, Jelon. But uh, my first marriage, I don't speak very much about, but I actually still have, I have right here, I have the, uh, the playlist of songs that were played at our wedding dance. Um, now, I will say in advance... Our marriage ended horribly. It was a it was a horrible, uh, bloody divorce. But um, some people blame it on the song selection <laughs> at our wedding, and I say nonsense. My first wife came up with this list. They're some of the most beautiful love songs ever written. Um, I don't know how people would possibly blame the song selection <laughs> at a wedding reception for the demise of the marriage, but. Uh, here we go, in no particular order. Uh, Linda Ronstadt, You're No Good. 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. Uh, Paul Simon, uh, Simon and Garfunkel. Freebird, uh, Leonard Skinner. Uh, Babe, I'm Going to Leave You by Led Zeppelin. D-I-V-O-R-C-E by Tammy Wynette. Divorce, it spells divorce. Uh, Bye 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 by NSYNC. Uh, go Your Own Way, Fleetwood Mac. Thank You Next, Ariana Grande. Um... We are never, ever, ever getting back together, Taylor Swift. And uh, finally, um, Love Hurts by Nazareth. So feel free to take those titles, run with them, have have fun. There is Terry Carnation's wedding playlist. Thank you so much for calling. Terry, how did you become so iconic? That's a real question. Also... My cat wants to say hi to Malachi. Love you. Thank you so much for your question. Iconic. Mmm. Iconic. Well, first of all, you need a name. You just need a, a good, memorable name. Something that really pops. People with normal names don't become icons. I mean, you can't become an icon with the name of Smith. I don't know. Will. <laughs> That's not going to work. A plain name like that will get you nowhere. No one will ever be talking about you. That doesn't work. So when I was a young man, I knew I needed to change my name and went with carnation because it is a symbol of undying love. It's everyone's favorite flowers. When you when you receive a bouquet of flower, what kind of flower do you hope is in that bouquet? That's right, carnations. So... Why don't you start there and see how it goes? Thank you so much for calling. Well, that was a rapid-fire round of fun, right, little Susie? Oh, boy. Yes, perfect, perfect sound effect. Thank you so much. Okay, well, time for the first story. This 
this takes place at my grandma's house. She lived right in the outskirts of the small town that I'm from. Most of my family was there. I think it was just kind of like a casual family hangout. Me being so young, I was just sort of playing in the living room, on the floor, watching TV. My grandma and my mom went out on the front porch. They were smokers. I see them come in and get the other adults. Come outside and look at this. And of course, when I see commotions going on, I jumped outside too. Everyone looking up into the sky and pointing and kind of like talking to each other. Do you see that? Like, is that... Am I seeing things? Like, what's going on? Once I looked up to see what they were looking at, and what everyone was seeing was what appeared to be the moon shaking and moving. But it would just kind of sit in one spot and it would shake or shiver a little bit. Everyone's seeing this super confusing thing in the sky. They looked at it and they were like, it looks like it's shaking. But we just kind of all sat there on our front porch looking at the moon shaking. Move down, do the same thing, and it would almost just kind of reset itself in just like a small central point. They called the neighbors over. They were like, we have something weird to ask you. Will you look up to the moon and do you see it doing anything strange? And they looked at it and they were like, it looks like it's shaking. And so we just kind of all sat there on our front porch looking at the moon shaking. A couple days after, I remember my grandma and my mom sitting at the dining room table. I could tell they felt uneasy about whatever this visit was. These two men decked out in black getups. The description of your cliche men in black. It wasn't like friends from work. They were strangers, even to them. I remember them having this conversation. As they're leaving, one of the guys kind of leans down to me, calls me over, he hands me a sucker. You're really well behaved for your age. I remember the other one saying, do we need to talk to him? The guy that was leaning down to me was like, he's too young, it's fine. I feel like they were trying to decide whether they thought I would remember the incident. I don't necessarily know what they could have quote unquote done in the conversation with my grandma and my mom. It seemed like that was almost their controlling of the situation was maybe talking to the adults. They could easily remember it. They could share that with people. And if they don't want that shared, they don't want it getting out. Of course, they're going to do something or threaten or whatever it may be the adults. I don't think we need to take care of him, whatever that means. You know, I don't think he's going to remember. I brought it up to both my grandma and my mom to see if they remember it. And whenever I do, it's like they kind of sit and it's almost like me saying this is like sparking some faint memory that they have. And it just sort of stops there. There's just no way that I can be the only one that remembers this. Individually, at different points in time, I brought it up to both my grandma and my mom. There's not an immediate, I guess, debunking on their side, or there's not an immediate voice of reason that they're presenting. Why do I have such a distinct memory of such a strange event? It's almost like me saying this is like sparking some faint memory that they have. I don't know why, but I seem to be like the only one that remembers it in detail. But they don't immediately say, 
oh yeah, I remember when that happened, it was a gas leak in the house that made us think that, or whatever it may be. The, the logic side of me would be like, oh, if it was a gas leak in the house that caused this kind of mass hysteria for us, they would probably say, oh yeah, of course, you're remembering it this way, but this is actually what happened, like adults would normally do when their kid misremembers something. It just sort of stays as this like dormant memory in their head that they can sort of make sense of, but they can't totally extract what happened. And it's sort of just me explaining it to them and them saying, you know, I was there and I, I know I experienced it, but I, I don't actually remember it at all. We saw something that was super strange, how no one else in the world seemingly saw it. That's a huge part that doesn't make any sense to me. Maybe we saw something that we shouldn't. We got a visit by the quote unquote men in black. Maybe they wiped the adults' memories. And that is insane for me to say because I'm not even sure that I believe it. But again, searching for answers as to why I remember this story and have remembered it over years, it's always stuck as the literal only unexplained thing I think I've ever experienced in my life. Just the idea of what I saw is so almost unexplainable or unrealistic that even when I explain it, I'm like, eh, that just that just doesn't make any sense. I don't know what that was. The moon moving in the sky is not just a small like, oh, there was a ghost in a house somewhere that someone experienced. If all of that actually happened, if it's a totally real experience, how many more things like that do happen or have happened? But what does that mean? Is there something larger that we don't know that is going on? I've Googled it over the years. Moon shaking or moon moving to see if there's any like weird articles or stories like this. And at least in my searches, I've never found anything. There's so many different people having so many different experiences and all this sort of stuff, whether it be something in the sky, something in the woods, something in their house, whatever. All these stories maybe exist for a reason. We can debunk stuff all day and we can give logic to things all day. And sometimes it's very easy to be like, oh no, this is why this happened. It's not that big a deal. It's not what we thought it was. And that's true sometimes. But other times, like this story, at least for me and my experience, it's one of those things that just sounds incredibly outrageous, but there's nothing that says that it didn't actually happen. I don't know what to tell you to make you believe, but all I can give you is my honest recount of what I believe I saw or experienced that night. If we're really diving into the conspiracy side, then it opens up the floodgates of like, well, what is the moon? If all of that actually happened, if it's a totally real experience, how many more things like that do happen or have happened? And then not only finding out like, did they happen? But then once you do, then you dive past like, but what does that mean? A man in black could walk in right now and be like, Hey, your moon story, 100% accurate, actually. 100%, I'm confirming it right now. But then what? So what does that mean? You know, what? I need more information. Like, what, what was the moon that night? Was it a projection? Was it a ship? What else is going on if that one incident is actually true? Uh-oh. Ooh. That's one for the ages. That one might have upset the kitties. How about we take the temperature down with a little marketing, hmm? Let's hear from some of our wonderful sponsors. Ah. 
And we're back, and it's time for another story. But first, some of you are asking how Susie and I are related, and to be honest, I don't really know. Somewhere down the line, my great-great-aunt had a tryst with a cursed seaman, and that's... No, no, listen to you. Get your mind out of the gutter. I mean, someone who's nautically inclined, a, a sailor of sorts. And I think that's Susie's side of the family. It would explain a lot, actually. She does kind of wistfully stare at the water. The other day, I found her gazing into the toilet bowl for at least half an hour. <laughs> Kids. Anyway, next tape. Hit it, Susie. <laughs> no, that's taps. We need a tape. Next tape. Oh, here we go. Just, just listen. I had just turned 21. I started going out with my friends since I had never gone out to clubs. When we did go out, I did have a friend that would normally get very, very drunk. There was this very popular club. I thought, you know what, it's my day off. And just to be safe, I invited my guy best friend at that time. When I get there, my best friend at that time, which was the girl, and her cousin and her other friend, they were already there for a little while. They were already having fun. They already had their drinks. So I thought, OK, I'll catch up. Luckily, as opposed to leaving when everything ends, like at 2 in the morning, they wanted to leave at 1. I got happy, and I'm like, we're going to go eat tacos. The night's over cool. As soon as me and my guy friend walk out, I see her and her two friends with three guys. I didn't think anything different. I just thought, okay, it's the usual guys. They just want to have them go over to their house. I don't know. I go up to them and I tell them, you know, let's go or let's go eat. My friend, the girl, she says, Look, this guy owns a Mexican restaurant down the street. Oh, which restaurant? He says the name. My guy friend right away knows which restaurant it is. I thought, okay, well, maybe it's real. The guy that was trying to have my three girlfriends go over, he says, yeah, but I'm just going to take them. I ask if me and my friend can come along, and him and his two friends kind of made a face. He would rather me and my guy friend not go. They just want to hang out with the three guys and the three girls. They were just bothered by the idea. My friends, they went with the three guys. I left alone with my guy friend. Once we got to the restaurant, it was super dark. At first, I didn't even see any cars out there. So in my head, I thought I knew it. They didn't come here. The parking lot for that place is really big. I look around the corner, and there was a couple cars back there. But the restaurant was so dark. We're walking by the window and all I see is just the bar light on. We knock on the window. The guy saw us, he made eye contact with us, but he just kind of stared at us. I can tell he was really mad that we showed up. I could see my friend, she was just knocked out on the bar and the other girls were hanging out with the other two guys. Finally, after I think it was like five minutes of us knocking, he starts walking and he opens the door. I was so worried about my friend that I just start walking towards her and I never saw that he locked the door behind us. I get my friend. She told me she wanted to go to the restroom to throw up. I had asked him if he could turn on the lights because when I tried turning on the restroom light, it wouldn't turn on. 
we just go to the restroom, we come out, he never turned on the light. When we're coming out, I kind of make a, a signal to my guy friend and I say, you know, it's time to go. The actual restaurant owner, he slams a beer on the bar and he says, no, no one's leaving yet. We're having a lot of fun here. My friend says, just sit down, just have one drink. And so I thought, you know, I'll just have one drink so this doesn't get out of hand. He asked me what I want to drink. I say a beer so I can watch him open it. No, I'm making mixed drinks, so you're going to drink one of these. And he just slides a drink to me, and of course I didn't touch it, but I had noticed that my friends, that's what they were drinking before I got there. Five minutes passed by and I thought, okay, I'm not here to play games, let's go. I grabbed my friend, she's already gone. She can barely walk. My guy friend helps me, we're carrying her out and we try to unlock the door. We notice that you can only use the key to unlock it. I turn around and I'm like, oh, can you unlock the door please? and he starts walking with his friends. No, I can't unlock it. Now the other two girls, I can tell by their face that they were scared too. They come up to us. My group is already standing by the door and we're just waiting for these guys to unlock this door. I had already ordered an Uber. I did notice that there was a car outside already. So I thought, obviously, that's not my Uber. My guy friend in Spanish, he says, hey, come on, just open the door. These girls are trying to get home. The owner of this place, he lifts up his shirt. And all I see is something shiny. It was a gun. I was a single mom at the time. All I could think about was I have to get home safe and alive. My friends were too drunk to even notice what was going on really. I just imagine we're all going to get shot. We're gonna die. He's so mad that we're not letting him get his way with these girls that he's going to shoot us. Once he showed us the gun, he tells my friend, oh, what did you say? What did you need? And my friend, I don't know if he didn't take it serious, but he kind of got really crazy too. And he just says, oh, I said, if you can open the door. I kind of knew he wanted to start a problem with him. Who's tougher than who type of situation. No, I can't open it. You can leave, but the girls all stay here. At this point, now he wants me to stay too. Of course not, that's not gonna happen. Just let the girls go and me and you can fix things, but let them go first. I just started crying. The Uber I had gotten finally arrived. I said, my Uber is outside, and he says, okay, go ahead and cancel it. He's telling me to take out my phone, and he wants to see me cancel the Uber. Of course, I wasn't going to do that. Since we were by the window, by where the cars were at, I was hoping that they would see that something's going on in there. I just put the phone in my purse, but I never canceled it. I guess he took my friend's word and they were going to figure things out, whatever that means. And he unlocks the door and tells him that all the girls can leave, but he wants him to stay. I run to the first car thinking it was the Uber I had ordered. When I get in the car, I see it's a girl. Okay, that's not the one I got, but who cares? It's an Uber, so let's go. The lady tells us to get off. 
that got me even more scared because I thought, okay, is she part of this? What is this? She starts telling us, get off, you guys are drunk. I'm not your Uber. I screamed, I said, that guy in there has a gun. He's threatening us. Start telling her everything. Finally, she's nice enough to say, okay, let's go. So we start driving away. I'm calling my friend. He wasn't answering. I didn't know what was happening. She took us to my best friend's house. We all got off so we would be in a safe spot. My friend just went straight to her room. I mean, she was just wasted. She just went to sleep like if nothing had happened. Me and the other girls were just still kind of talking about it. I was just so scared that I was kind of speechless. I had cried so much that I could barely talk. The fact that my friend wasn't answering me, I thought, okay, he got shot. After about an hour, my friend finally calls me and asks me where I'm at. He drives there and I ask him, so what did you guys do? They were kind of just going back and forth. He's like, so yeah, they all had guns, but don't worry, nothing happened. The restaurant owner pretty much said that me and him ruined his night. He does this every weekend. He has a special place in the back of his restaurant where he takes girls and does really bad things back there. I asked him how things calmed down magically when we left. He said that they did go outside in the parking lot. My friend had a gun too in his car. I guess my friend does know people around there that wouldn't let something like that go if they did something to him. I don't know if the owner got scared or what happened, but he said that they did argue and they showed each other what they had. At the end, the guy was just so mad that he was just like, just get the F out of here. I'm going to tell the cops. I'm going to report this. They told me no because the guys would find us and now they would do something to us. At that time, I had bright blue hair and I worked really close to that nightclub that we were at. I was so paranoid and so scared that I thought, yeah, maybe I shouldn't say anything. And I just kept it to myself. It just terrifies me to think that I was put in a situation like that. I think that one time was my wake-up call. No matter how much I care about my friends, I wasn't going to be taking care of anybody anymore. Something really bad could have happened to me, to them. It scares me that there's people out there that do such bad things, and it's so normal to them. Need a break? Great. How about an ad break? <laughs> See what I did there? And we're back. Okay, a few more questions. Let's go. Hi, Terry. My name is Marissa. I'm calling from Chicago. I'm a huge fan of this show. Um, and I'm a longtime listener, but this is my first call. Anyways, I really want to know how Malachi got his name. Um, could you enlighten us? Like I said, big fan. Thank you so much. Keep up the great work. Oh, excellent question, Malachi. Malachi was quite simply named from the character from Children of the Corn, 
Perhaps you've seen uh, Malachi the Enforcer. Malachi Boardman is his full name. Luscious long red hair. Carries a scythe. Slaughtered many, uh, uh, <laughs> many adults and children in their strange corn-obsessed farm cult. Um, ultimately, he's slaughtered by Isaac. So that is, that's now <laughs> Malachi got his name. This adorable little, little could you come here, Malachi? Come here, sweetie. Ow, God. <laughs> Bit my hand, little shit. Oh, and we got another Malachi call. Um, let's see what happens here. Um... Hello, we're just curious how Malachi is doing. We want to make sure that he's okay. He seems a little off recently, and now that it's out of pumpkin spice seasoning, I'm curious what his new addiction is. Uh, addictions, yes, uh, addictions. Well, as you know, Malachi has, uh, struggled, uh, for many years struggled with an addiction to pumpkin spice lattes. I uh, wouldn't eat any other food. Uh, I had to go to Starbucks three times a day, get a venti pumpkin spice lattes. That was the only food Malachi would eat. And now he's just addicted to belly rubs. <laughs> he's also addicted to fame. He loves it when people come in and pet him and recognize him from the show. Oh, hello, Malachi. How are you? Um, he's certainly addicted to other people's business. Hello, stay out of your, out of my business, Malachi. Stay, get your own podcast, idiot. Um, he, uh, well, he's addicted to, um, what else? What else is he addicted to? Um, sports betting. Um, yep, uh, on DraftKings, I found that he put $2,000 off of my credit card and bet it all on Fresno State <laughs> to win the NCAA championship. <laughs> they were barely a 500 team. So I'm out 2,000 smackers thanks to that. Not fun. Gambling addiction is not fun. If you have problems with it, call 1-800. I don't know what the actual phone number is, but I'm sure that there's a toll-free number. And uh, sometimes it feels like he's addicted to me. So <laughs> get off my lap. <laughs> Smell like a litter box. Thanks for your questions. I love you all, Carnation Nation. <laughs> That's right, I've seen the fan groups. <laughs> I love it, it rhymes. Carnation Nation. And I will see you next week at Radio Rental. <laughs> Susie, no. Don't do that. Don't do that again. Radio Rental is created by Payne Lindsay and brought to you by Tenderfoot TV. Lead producer is Eric Quintana. Executive producers are Payne Lindsay and Donald Albright. Hosted by Rain Wilson as his character, Terry Carnation. Written and produced by Meredith Stedman. Supervising producer is Tracy Kaplan. Associate producer is Jaja Muhammad. Editing by Eric Quintana, Mike Rooney, Sean Nerney, and Sydney Evans. Additional writing by Mark Lachlan. Sound design, mix, and master by Cooper Skinner. Additional sound design and mixing by Devin Johnson. Original score by Makeup and Vanity Set. Video editing by Dylan Harrington. Cover artwork by Trevor Eiler and Rob Sheridan. Special thanks to Oren Rosenbaum and the team at UTA, the Nord Group, Station 16, Beck Media and Marketing, and the team at Cadence 13. If you have a radio rental story that you'd like to share, please email us at yourscarystory at gmail.com or contact us via the form on our website, radiorentalusa.com. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Radio Rental. You can also follow the illustrious Terry Carnation on social media. Just search at Terry Carnation. On behalf of the Radio Rental store, we'd love it if you'd subscribe, rate, and review. Thanks for listening. <laughs>